It's. Uh, I think we are waiting for the queue yeah. from the tech or not? Not quite yet. Okay. No. Thanks. Oh, there we are. Yeah. All right. Uh, welcome everybody who's here. We have 35 participants, which I'm quite impressed with. Um, this is the panel on synthetic biology. Uh, your panelists are me, Jennifer Weller, who's the moderator, um, Dr. Ron Taylor, and Dr. Don Schuyler, and Dr. Anna Kashina. We're going to talk a little bit about both the art as well as the science of synthetic biology. Each of us will talk a little bit about sort of our favorite pet project right now. And we're going to ask that you put any questions you have for us into the Q&A. And we'll have a specific Q&A session at the end. You can certainly chat among yourselves using the chat box. But um, for anything specific you'd like one of us to, to address, please put it in the Q&A. And as moderator, then I will try to get it, fit it in comfortably so we don't interrupt people all the time, but you get your question answered. So um, I will first introduce myself and, and have everybody introduce themselves before we start into the meat of it. So I, I can see we still have participants joining. So that will give us a little bit of a cushion. So I am a professor of bioinformatics and genomics at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I'm also a lifelong science fiction fan and my friend Ron Taylor finally convinced me last year that this was a really cool venue to feed both of those passions. Um, and I'm really happy to join you all. Um, I like the science fiction that's got more of the hard science where the science is speculative but possible rather than just kind of another word for magic. Um, but I know there's a large distribution of people on that spectrum. My own research focuses on structure function relationships in DNA and RNA. So I tend to like the synthetic biology that's sort of right at the base level. Like how do we code for completely alien life and what does that mean? But everybody here has a different aspect of that that they'll be talking about. So I'm interested in how form constrains function. And then if you understand what that relationship is, can you subvert the rules anyway? Um, and when you do that, what happens? <laughs> is it good or bad? So I will now pass the uh, introduction ball on to Anna. Hi, so my name is Anna Kashina. I'm a professor of biochemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also a fantasy author. So uh, I go to science fiction and fantasy conventions to combine both of this occupations and passions. So uh, I'm very interested in synthetic biology. I, I use it every day as a tool. So my latest project and, uh, and the discovery was how silent mutations in the genome affect protein functions and how manipulating silent mutations, which are the mutations that don't produce any changes in the protein, can really at the same time dramatically alter everything about this protein. So we kind of call it the sound of silence, which, which is a term right now. <laughs> and uh, I'm like currently, so in the coronavirus crisis, we started doing this work in application to coronavirus and we find that coronavirus proteins are governed by the same principles. So I'm very interested in like a potential of designing a synthetic virus, which, which would be identical to the real one, but not virulent and which would be like ultimate goal for a vaccine, of course. So. Yeah, so that's kind of my current take on synthetic biology. Okay, John Schuyler. Hi, um, I'm Dr. John Schuyler. Uh, by training, I'm a virologist. I currently work in science communications at a pharmaceutical company. Um, I'm also a science fiction author with uh, several short stories around. Um, and my background as a virologist focuses on the uh, actually the study of human immune responses to RNA viruses that emerged in bats. Um, but when it comes to synthetic biology, I'm a little bit more focused on uh, use of viruses as tools uh, in the laboratory. For example, um, just to tie it into to the coronavirus situation, for example, using other viruses as backbones for the creation of vaccines, uh, and that's being done among many other projects that's being done for coronavirus at Oxford. Uh, using an adenovirus background. Oh, Ron? Um, I am recently joined the National Cancer Institute as chief of an information technology branch in the developmental therapeutics program. Um, we maintain the databases storing NCI 60 cell screening results, uh, among other things. And I'm involved in large-scale data integration efforts, knowledge discovery. Um, before that, 
Uh, I worked a little closer to the areas of synthetic biology. Um, I, my dissertation was in the area of inference of regulatory networks. I spent many years at Pacific Northwest National Lab uh, studying bacteria um, and communities of bacteria, um, doing whole genome modeling, uh, modeling metabolic pathways and communications between bacteria. Um, and I've been a longtime science fiction fan. Uh, and like Jennifer, I, I like hard science fiction, uh, though I, I will also have a taste for fantasy and a good vampire story now and then. <laughs> okay, that's what Hashimoji, Hashimoji DNA is for the vampires. <laughs> that's a <laughs> right, technology uh, project right there. So. <laughs> exactly. All right, well, thank you everybody for that. And now I think we'll just dive into the science. And as I said, since we don't really have that audience visualization. I'm just going to have each of you talk in turn and then I will take up whatever time is left. So um, maybe Anna, you were talking about sort of what you're what you're doing right now in the lab with the silent sound of silence. Can you yeah, right. expand on that a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, so um, so uh, I'm kind of like starting with the genetic code. I'm sure, uh, assuming everybody is familiar with the genetic code. So this is like uh, our DNA is composed of uh, genes and each gene, the coding sequence contains triplets of nucleotides, each of them encoding for one amino acid. So there are 20 amino acids, uh, which uh, normally exist like in a normal organism. And each amino acid can be encoded by different codons uh, between usually between two and six codons can encode for one amino acid. So you can vary uh, the, gen the sequence of, of the nucleotides without varying the sequence of amino acids. And as it turns out, uh, there are many very similar genes which encode, um, I mean, so, so they encode very similar proteins, but their nucleotide sequence is very different. And uh, for the longest time, people just assume this is kind of a natural variation. It doesn't mean anything. So what we discovered is that in some cases, this nucleotide sequence without making any changes at the protein level produces very different functions of a protein. And this is because in addition to the sequence of amino acids, the sequence also uh, determines how fast is this protein going to be produced and how fast it's produced determines how stable it's going to be and how it's going to fold and how it's going to get modified. So, um, so as it turns out, uh, very similar proteins can differ a lot just because of this nucleotide sequence. So very recently, we started looking at the coronaviruses from that perspective and thinking, how can we, and so by altering the nucleotide sequence without altering the amino acid sequence, the coronavirus uh, technically, so it would be the same coronavirus with the same proteins, but it could have very different effects on cells. So some of this virus may not be nearly as infectious, some versions of it as the other versions. So what, uh, so and then uh, coming from that uh, vaccine, so for a successful vaccine, you want to produce a virus which is as close as possible to the real one, but without causing people to get sick. So then in this case, it will produce the same immune response, but then like very well, very mild symptoms. I mean, well, no one, we get vaccinated, we might have some pain, some people have a little bit of a fever, but we don't develop any deadly disease. So if we can modify the virus in this way, so make a version of the coronavirus, which um, I mean, produces something that the body recognizes the same way in terms of immune response, but not the same way in terms of getting sick. I think this would really kind of uh, <laughs> handle the whole problem eventually. And of course, yeah, I know that there are many um, attempts to do it. There are like currently reportedly several successful clinical trials with different vaccines with different approaches, but, um, but we don't yet know if they're going to be successful in the end. I remember that at some point people talked about HIV vaccine, but this never happened. So this is kind of a bad case scenario for coronavirus. We hope it's not like that, but it could well be turn out to be the case. And in this case, this new approach is like this by um, producing a synthetic virus, which is as close as possible to normal might work actually. So, so that's kind of my current, so I'm currently doing some research in that direction and also looking at how the proteins and the virus get modified. So yeah. And how do, how do they modify the host proteins also? Yeah. So that's, that's, my... a, that's a pretty complex system you're talking Sorry, about. Yeah. <laughs> and I just kind of started with really hard science. So I hope it was okay. You know, yeah. so, so if, a, if I can do a follow-up quick since nobody else has asked a question yet. Um, 
So you're assuming that there's, well, you sort of indicated at the end there might be a genotype specific response, which then might mean that one sort of innocuous coronavirus in one genotype might not be the same in another. How many of those are you going to like try to gather? So, I mean, ideally you want to change it a lot, as much as possible on the nucleotide level without changing it at the amino acid level very much. Because if you change at the amino acid level, then you produce immune response to a different thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, ultimately, um, sorry, your question was how much different it's going to be? But, well, how much are you taking that into account in your experiments, I guess? I don't, I mean, so it could be really, yeah. really complicated and I don't yeah, sorry. <laughs> any <laughs> data. But the, you know, one question is, is it necessarily true that one set of modified codons will behave differently in every human genotype? Yeah, so uh, ideally, yeah, you want to find the one that works. So as far as I know right now, people sequence different coronaviruses and they differ so that we can recognize their origins, but they differ only by very few substitutions, actually. So uh, it doesn't mutate very fast. So we, we expect that producing more substitutions uh, would, would probably uh, cause the same response in, in most people. So obviously, yeah, there are differences in how people respond because people have very different symptoms of coronavirus, right. some of them. But so evolutionary successful virus actually is the one that doesn't make host very sick so that it can amplify without the host minding it a lot. So. I don't think they like volunteer that way though. I think we right. just... We, we but that means a very deadly virus is like a bola. They're very easy to eradicate in some like because so, like there's no issue that some people walk around without any symptoms, just shedding the virus to others. Right. So you get the virus, you're really sick, so you can be really isolated easily. So yeah, so in a way, uh, what we want to do will kind of be kind of I mean, it will be going in the same way that the evolution would go for this virus, but just pushing it further away so it becomes harmless instead right. of harmful. And I think this virus, uh, even if you just let it out in the community, which we're not going to do, of course, but it would win out over the natural virus because, I mean, the less uh, deadly the virus is, the easier it is for it to propagate and stay in the population. So for the virus, it doesn't want to kill us. It just wants to amplify. And right. It's <laughs> yeah, right. So for help, it's 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 to, the yeah. virus, like what it wants, is just yeah. what its success is. So. And I think, yeah, the synthetic project going along with the evolution kind of, this is what makes it possible. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, right. I don't, so somebody commented that there was a classic experiment using codon scrambled poliovirus from the mm -hmm. aughts. I don't know if you're familiar with that one or not. Yeah, let me see the comment. Okay, <laughs> all right. It's in the Q&A. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I, remember when, I remember when that paper came out. Right. Yeah, it started a whole rash of codon, codon optimization projects for various viruses. Can we, can we reduce codon optimization? Can we improve codon optimization? Mm -hmm. And it was a, a kind of a landmark. Um, polio yeah. forms a very good model system uh, for a lot of virological experiments because we know so much about the virus itself and it's also very easy to grow. Um, mm -hmm. Although I'm under the understanding that a lot of polio labs have walked away from doing polio exp poliovirus experiments directly, um, given how close we are to eradication of the virus right. altogether um, mm -hmm. from anywhere in the world. So I, I know a lot of labs have destroyed their stocks. And mm -hmm. um, there's actually another poliovirus paper that, that I was very affected by um, that I think is interesting in the context of, of synthetic biology because. Yeah, you know, one of the problems we have to tackle with with uh, synthetic biology is the unintended consequences of anything that we might create. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this ties into what Anna was saying about um, uh, about mutation of virus as it as it propagates through the population. So uh, yeah. a group yeah. uh, led by a man named Raul Andino, who's a famous virologist, um, managed to create variants of poliovirus that mutate at different rates. And if we think back to the coronavirus example, coronavirus, mm -hmm. specifically SARS-CoV-2, um, but coronaviruses in general have this error correction mechanism that reduces the amount that they mutate, making them actually much more faithful to their own genomes mm -hmm. than other species of virus, um, especially other species of RNA viruses. Uh, right. Poliovirus mutates quite frequently, but 
you can mutate it to change the frequency uh, at which it mutates. I know that's a little convoluted as the sentence goes, but you could make it mutate less or make it mutate more, creating different strains. And what the Andino group did is they created all these different polioviruses that mutated at different rates. Um, and they found that actually, if you make it mutate less, it's a less fit virus in mice. If you mm -hmm. make it mutate more, it's a less fit virus in mice. Okay. So each virus is kind of evolve to have this optimal level of self mutation that yeah. helps it propagate in the way that it's intended to propagate. Mm -hmm. And probably that's because given how small their genomes are, they need to mutate in order to complete some of their vital infection functions. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it, it could, it could be sort of like a genomic Swiss army knife where they have something that's almost a purpose built tool for the right, for the right thing, but it works well for the other thing. And then they specialize during the infection to do both tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that mutation rate optimization is something we have to be very cognizant of, especially when designing things like vaccines or other virus, or virus derived tools, uh, such as like gene therapies, um, to make sure that whatever causes our, our tool to propagate within the system doesn't cause it to mutate and, and revert. Um, mm -hmm. To harken back to polio, the Sabin polio vaccine is a fantastic vaccine that can protect you mm -hmm. from both poliomyelitis as well as uh, the, gastro, uh, the, the, the gastrointestinal infection polio causes. The, or, the killed polio vaccine, the salt vaccine, doesn't protect you against the, the, the uh, gastrointestinal infection. It only protects you against poliomyelitis. Mm -hmm. So the Sabin vaccine protects you against both and thus prevents people from becoming reservoirs for the virus. Uh, if you've only had the salt vaccine, you can get infected, you can propagate the virus, you just won't ever get, get poliomyelitis. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, while the Sabin vaccine is fantastic uh, in that respect, it can revert and it can become an infectious virus again. And so you get some, in, in like some number of millions of cases, there is one mm -hmm. or two uh, where there's revertent polio. So obviously we want to switch to the, the salt vaccine whenever possible, um, but only in, in a situation where we don't think that we'll thus create reservoirs for the virus. So this is a very like realistic problem that we've, mm -hmm. that we've had for going on 60 years of uh, yeah. synthetic yeah. tools that, that mutate. Um, yeah, actually, and, so what you yeah. said kind of made me think, so the origin of SARS-CoV-2 in itself, so we had the, SARS-1 virus, and then we have a MERS virus, and then so they're all cover coronavirus infections, which kind of went away on their own. So SARS-CoV-2, uh, even though the origins are not like completely fully verified, so I think the current uh, most plausible theory is that the, it was co-infecting, so it was SARS-1 co-infecting the same host animal together with another virus, and there was a recombination event which made that like so much more virulent and kind of we made it into what we were seeing today. So just kind of a very small, um, those kind of natural synthetic biology event. Mm -hmm. such. Yeah. yeah. Although right. I think the big question with that is, was it, a, was it a recombination event that made the virus more, more pathogenic or less pathogenic? It seems like it's less actually, if you look at what happened with, uh, with SARS-1. It, it was a more deadly virus, but it- Well, it made it more successful. I mean, a success yeah. of a virus actually doesn't, I mean, like I said, less deadly viruses are more successful, yes. Yeah, so, and this is kind of, yeah. So since you're both by much more virologists than I am, um, can you talk to the notion of, of using the RNA itself as the immunogen rather than the proteins? Well, so I'm going to make a lot of people unhappy if I do that. Please do, please do. <laughs> this is what I want to hear. I, so, I RNA and the, so the immune response is caused by like the surface proteins of the virus, right? So the RNA, so there are many problems that with using RNA. One is like there are so many RNAs, and RNA is such an unstable molecule that the moment it gets like in contact. With your skin, it will probably get degraded. So, well, I think there yeah. Right. So, yeah. But I, I still, I mean, I tried 20 years ago in a biotech company to, to look at that, and we never got anywhere with it. But I do, mm. I read. So, John, can you address it without getting in trouble? Right, okay. You're starting to say what I, what I would probably say, though, is the thing. It, so, I, I think just to put it all out there, it sounds like what you're referencing is the Moderna 
mRNA based vaccine. Yes, I, did, I didn't want to actually yeah. say the name of the company, but that's exactly yeah. what I'm referring to because I've been reading about it. <laughs> We're getting really, in trouble here. <laughs> not believing yeah. any of it, but um, you know better than I do, like, you know, how, how maybe things have improved in 20 years. So thankfully, I do not currently work in the vaccine space, so I can I can speak with a certain amount of freedom about this. Um, but the Moderna vaccine, just for for uh, the audience's sake, um, the Moderna vaccine is based on virus mRNA. So it's mRNA. It's actually it's, it's human style mRNA. So it's recognized as self by the body um, that produces the I believe the virus spike protein um, and through use of that mRNA plus uh, some kind of mildly irritating compound that, that is called an adjuvant, you create an immune response to uh, to the virus spike protein, and thus you get antibodies against the virus. That's a, that's a theory. Um, now, in the past, these, these nucleic acid vaccines have been a, a really big hope because they could reduce all kinds of, of problems with vaccination. Um, for example, you can get much bigger doses of protein by just injecting DNA and getting cells to produce protein for you. So instead of injecting a, a dose of protein that you need to really get into deep muscle tissue, say for, for a flu vaccination or um, some, other, some other type of vaccination, you could use DNA and get the cells to produce it for you on your own and use maybe micro needles to deliver it. And uh, every single experience that I had looking at a vaccine of this type was like a complete failure. Um, it was it was really just bad, um, honestly. Just every time I saw data from a vaccine like this, it just didn't it just didn't deliver um, the way that that we would hope. Uh, but if you look at the mRNA vaccine, the, the promise is that mRNA is very very efficient at turning into protein very quickly. Um, and using clever engineering, you can get cells to take it up pretty readily, uh, which is another problem with DNA vaccines. Is the cells don't officially, don't efficiently uh, take in the, the DNA and don't efficiently express the protein. So mRNA um, skips the DNA middleman and gets you protein production relatively rapidly. And so the thought is that this would this would produce a pretty good immune response. Um, I, I was hoping, and am still hoping, that it will. Um, but I do think that the initial uh, experiments that, that Moderna has released are not extremely promising. I know they made a lot of headlines in the last week for eight patients having an immune response in their uh, initial phase one trial. But what the headlines, uh, for some reason, omitted very frequently is that there were 45 patients in the trial. So if we're getting eight out of 45, that's, that's not a great deal. Um, what is reassuring, though, is that the vaccine modality was safe. And considering that an RNA vaccine of this type has not been tried before, that is an actually really big win for the technology. Um, so here's hoping that uh, either some kind of refinement will take place or the vaccine itself will actually work once we get into phase two, phase three trials. So how do they protect us from degradation, the mRNA? I, I have a feeling they have some kind of preservative involved, but I would need to know a little bit more about it. Um, I think that they have some still proprietary elements of their technology that I'm not mm -hmm. fully versed in. Because mRNA is such an unstable molecule, it's like, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> so this is our yeah. hope for kind of an old trouble. <laughs> yeah, when we were working, yeah. with it, we were trying some of the synthetic backbones but to keep it from being degraded, but then those turned out to be super immunogenic. Um, and so, I, I mean, it didn't even get as far as a phase one trial or anything. It was just you know, trying things out in um, tissue culture cells. And we got a fabulous response to the chemistry, but not to the mRNA or its product. So it, that, did, that approach didn't work either, even though it was something you could think about doing in synthetic biology. So, yeah. um, so John, that was great. We carried right on with the coronavirus, which we weren't really going to talk about that much, but who won't right now? Um, do you have other things that you are like currently following with a certain amount of passion, or is that just it because that's what's going on right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's hard not to be focused on the pandemic, certainly, um, but I, I do think that there are some interesting uh, futures in, in synthetic biology that have been going on. I mean, something that, that I think is, is particularly fascinating is that um, we live in a world now where there is a marketed virus-derived gene therapy product that is available for actual patients to, con to cure a congenital form of blindness. 
from a company called Spark Therapeutics uh, based out of Philadelphia. Um, and it's, that is truly amazing. Uh, there, there is a congenital genetic, uh, sorry, not congenital. I shouldn't have said congenital hereditary blindness, um, that can be corrected using a, uh, a gene editing platform that can be delivered to patients, uh, using an adenovirus back, backbone, which I, I know I mentioned earlier on, uh, discussing the Oxford, coronavirus chimera vaccine. Um, and adenoviruses are just particularly useful because we know they're not all that harmful to humans. Um, and also there are 50 serotypes of them. So there's this, this hope that uh, you could create a therapy that has a backbone that you probably don't already have antibodies against because uh, that has always been a, an issue. <laughs> if, you've, if you've had the virus that, that the backbone is based on, then it's going to hamper the therapeutic effect. But this is this is on the market and I know they're pursuing additional um additional therapeutic targets for their for their technology platform and, and using um using this this actually I'm sorry, it's adeno associated virus, which is even more interesting. So um adenoviruses are are a common cold type virus that infects the the throat. Um and adeno associated virus is an additional virus that requires an active adenovirus infection to propagate. So it is often called a virus of a virus, but it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than that because it, it's not that it infects the virus particle, but rather that it must infect an adenovirus infected cell. So like a remora on a virus rather than a virus. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, but in its own way, also, it's less harmful because, it, you know, if you don't have the adenovirus, then you're not going to get any trouble from adeno-associated virus either. Um, so and it also seems to be interocularly or something like that. I mean, I, I read about something that was being tried with an interocular kind of treatment so that it would be somewhat um, separated from the rest of the immune system. Yeah, so that's that's one of the advantages that the the uh, ocular system is something of an immune privileged space. But I'm always very wary of saying the phrase immune privileged space these days because it, it, every time we've thought something is an immune privileged space, it turns out that we're just completely wrong about that. And there's some specific cell type that actually is engaged in immune responses in this privileged zone that we just didn't know about before. Um, but yeah, my, my understanding is that there's an intraocular injection and it corrects the genetic defects and can restore eyesight in children, which is, I mean, amazing. Yeah. I almost can't believe I'm saying those words. Um, <laughs> I wish they could do something for adults with macular degeneration, but I yeah. guess that would be later. Probably yeah. more genetic. Yeah, it's, it's too. substantially easier to fix genetic problems than it is to fix degenerative problems. Right. right. So we need the bionic man. <laughs> That would be nice. <laughs> so, Ron, do you want to talk about something completely different? And do you want yes, to talk about yes. uh, okay. something a little happier than the current? Uh, well, actually. off topic anyway. I'm going. I'm going to try to pull up my slides, but I'm not quite sure where that is right now. So you might just have to talk. Oh, okay. Um, in fall of 2019, last year. A uh, team at the Wiseman Institute published a remarkable paper, um, and this concerns making bacterium, our workhorse E. coli, uh, function in the matter of a plant in terms of the food it can use. Uh, and that it means using CO2 as its food source rather than sugars. Um, this is a remarkable achievement. Mm -hmm. I mean, truly outstanding uh, and could have vast implications uh, for the future. Uh, I see you got the slide up. Good. I'm glad you can see it. Thank you for letting <laughs> me know. I was looking away in the background trying to figure out how to make that work. Uh, this was done in Ron Milo's lab. Um, and they did, they hit, they worked on this for over a decade. And many other teams worldwide have worked on this. Uh, Pam Silver's uh, team at Harvard Med and, and Dr. Silver's at Giant in Synthetic Biology, they failed. Um, uh, the idea is to add a pathway that plants use, uh, a variant of the Calvin cycle, 
um, that allows uh, CO2 to be used uh, as a food source and turn it into uh, organic compounds, uh, proteins, um, you know, other things um, that the cell needs to grow. Um, and various teams have worked on this um, and have added genes that produce the enzymes that would allow the, this cycle to work. The, but there's a huge problem in the sense that the organism prefers to use its standard pathways uh, to and uh, standard food sources, um, you know, simple sugars. Uh, what uh, Glazer et al. And, and Dr. Miles Lab have done is to stop E. coli from using the usual food sources and force it to use CO2 as its only food source, uh, as a plant would do, um, and grow. Um, it is, as I said, a, a truly remarkable achievement. Um, they added um, a gene uh, that allows, them, uh, allows the E. coli, uh, the, this new variant of E. coli, to use formate, um, and, uh, but not using formate to actually produce organic compounds, but simply as an energy source. Uh, and that energy is then used, uh, that it, it creates ATP. Um, it allows the new pathway, which was created by the addition of a set of uh, additional genes, um, to, it powers that pathway, a conversion of CO2 to sugars and proteins and other organic molecules. Uh, that's one thing they did, and you can see the diagram here. Uh, they added this autotrophic cycle uh, to produce biomass, or those organic compounds I was talking about, uh, from CO2, and they uh, added uh, an enzyme, a gene that produces FDH, and another enzyme that allows them to uh, formate to be used as an energy source. Uh, to power this new pathway. Um, once that's done, they then have, there's an additional step, which took them a long time to do. Uh, and this is a, a critical step. You have to use the, you have to force the organism to use the new cycle, uh, to use the, the introduced pathway. And what they did is they did laboratory directed evolution um, in a chemostat they uh, had just one food source that the ordinary pathways could use, uh, xylose, a simple sugar. And over time, um, they kept decreasing the amount of xylose in the chemostat, uh, thus uh, 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 using natural selection to uh, the E. coli, um, uh, cell um, organisms that could make better use of of the CO2 as a food uh, would uh, be uh, have preferential, preferential growth. And so over a period of time, uh, a long number of uh, generations, I think it was on the order of uh, 200, something like that, they were able to create a version of E. coli that could exist in the chemostatic conditions that only use CO2 as its food source, produce sugars and other organic compounds, like a plant. Um, now, uh, this is, um, as I say on the slide here, a metabolic heart transplant. Uh, it is a, a fundamental change to cellular meta meta uh, metabolism. It's huge. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's um, I mean, if there were, uh, if, if, if uh, people build on this work uh, to the point where um, we can use uh, E. coli, well, let me step back for a second. Uh, this is the article. Uh, um, Jennifer just brought up the article. It's published in Cell. Uh, the idea here is uh, there are, um, you know, uh, bacteria, uh, cyanobacteria that uh, can use CO2 like a plant, but, and there are plants of, uh, uh, themselves, of course, but there are, and there are, uh, 
but they're hard to use to generate useful compounds. E. coli is a chassis that we've worked with for a long time to produce useful compounds, um, but uh, sometimes the food that the E. coli needs, uh, say the sugars, uh, make it expensive to use. Here, uh, the authors are taking um, CO2 as, as the food source, hopefully potentially making it much, much cheaper to use E. coli to produce these useful compounds. Uh, also, um, as the authors note in the future, uh, this might be one means of um, decreasing um, CO2 content in the atmosphere, which is something people are worrying about in terms of you know, climate change and so forth. Uh, if, uh, Jennifer, if you, go, if you go back to the previous slide. There we go. Okay. Um, there is additional work needed. Uh, the growing time um, of these E. coli just using CO2 as a food source uh, takes 18 hours instead of 20 minutes, so it's over 50 times longer. Also, the amount of CO2 needed is nothing like standard uh, CO2 contact in, at, uh, in the atmosphere. It, it's over 200 times greater. So obviously more work needs to be done, but still this is a huge achievement. Um, and uh, it was done by Introducing a gene uh, for an enzyme that can use formate, introducing three genes to produce enzymes for the uh, Kelvin cycle, doing directed laboratory evolution. I will mention one more thing. Uh, in the laboratory evolution, they noted that the E. coli organisms over the period of generations made it look like a small number of changes, about I think something like 11, uh, in their genome that allowed them to uh, you, uh, you know, move over to using CO2 as a food source. Um, and they characterized they, uh, those 11 changes as either changes that were known to be related to genes involved in the Calvin cycle, genes that were known to be involved when um, E. coli altered themselves to survive in chemostats, or a third interesting group where changes were noted in genes of unknown function, which might be useful in determining how to make uh, bacteria into autotrophs uh, uh, when they investigate it for further. Um, having said all that, um, I think I'm about done. I, I, again, just noting, this is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Ron, have you read any of the recent articles about the enhanced photosynthesis? Um, well, I think that is being done in cyanobacteria, of course, because it would be complicated to transplant chloroplasts into E. coli. But there's also been a big push to improve the efficiency of photosynthesis and then re-engineer the structure of chloroplasts so they can actually use the improved efficiency of photosynthesis. There was a recent article in one of the synthetic biology journals about that. No, that's another approach. I have not read about that. Unfortunately, I have to focus primarily on cancer research at the moment. <laughs> no, I know. I just, that was interesting and it's sort of, to, you could see these two things kind of dovetailing eventually, as if you could use CO2, yeah. but also have enhanced photosynthesis. Uh, maybe you could optimize everything. I don't know, but anyway, cool. Yeah. All right, let me see if there's any comments before I, or if any of the other panelists want to uh, hop in. No, I think we actually, uh, well, one person a while back wanted to know um, when we think body parts will be made on demand. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I know, uh, like never, but um, uh, I think we're, we're, we're going to clone people sooner than we're going to make new, some new body parts. I mean, I think some organs with a lot of patterning and not too many different kinds of specialized tissues you might be able to do, certainly bone and things like that, um, they're working on pretty hard. But anything too complicated, I don't really see how you're going to pattern it properly. Well, I guess the yeah, question I mean, will be, depends on which body part, I would say. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think it's more likely for complex organs that what we're going to see is some kind of hybrid uh, bioelectronic device 
um, mm -hmm. where, you know, we've created a, a, say, just use the heart as an example, where we've created, say, a, a heart-shaped extracellular matrix mm -hmm. artificially. So, you know, one thing that I think has come up when we've done this panel before is the important point that um, bodies are not made of cells, they're made by cells. Um, and so there's a, there's a large amount of material in, in a person or an animal or a plant that is not actually cellular material, it's this extracellular matrix. Um, and if you decellularize a heart, you'll still have something that is, to the eye, a heart. It, it looks just like it, it's got the same shape, it just doesn't have the cells necessary for it to function. And so there have been folks who've been able to make a heart's extracellular matrix in a laboratory setting, or at least an animal heart, um, successfully. And my, my feeling is that while we may not be able to generate a, a complete functioning heart, we may be able to generate something that forms a scaffold for us to be able to insert small machines that are able to make it beat, that are able to make an interface with the brain to beat appropriately and to respond to extra, uh, well, I don't know, I was going to say extra organic, but that doesn't really work, um, to, to, to respond to external signals um, so maybe and, like and function as a heart does. So maybe like a pacemaker, a scaffold that's sort of flexible and a pacemaker. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it would take a number to... of gadgets. Yeah. Yeah, we already make for a while artificial heart valves and artificial joints. So we're right. kind of... Yeah. Well, in the way there, so it's just working you know. towards bits and pieces, but right, I think absolutely. you're right. I just can't imagine. I guess you could potentially 3D print a scaffold in which you also had signals mm -hmm. for specialized cells to populate it, but I can just think of so many things that could go wrong <laughs> with that. Yeah. I don't want to be the one to volunteer for that experiment, but um, yeah. the mice will no doubt volunteer for those experiments. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's one of the reasons I think it's likely that this will be for organs like the heart, um, mm -hmm. because for the patients that would be the, the first line, it, it would be kind of this experimental option or not really any viable alternatives. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I don't think that they're going to, you know, that we're going to see artificial spleens as the first uh, target or certainly the artificial appendix is a long, will be a long way in coming. A pancreas um, would be nice for people with diabetes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I could see that. Since it's such a, a huge uh, pandemic of its own right now, it seems like that might be a good one to focus uh, on. But I have no idea how complicated they are. If I can interrupt, I, I was oh, saying yes. something in the Q&A. Um, oh, sorry. There was a question, of what happens if the CO2 eating bacteria is released in the atmosphere? Uh -huh. And the answer is nothing. They die off because they need 200 times the amount of CO2 <laughs> presently in the atmosphere <laughs> to grow. Um, it's not a bad question, though, because we do worry about unintended consequences once you've sped it up to, you know, 50 times faster and it can deal with much lower CO2, yeah. um, which is a good lead in to my part, which is completely alien synthetic biology. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes to talk about my own passion. Um, I was going to introduce just sort of the top down versus bottom up versions of synthetic biology. We've also, we've all mostly been talking about bottom up except for Ron, who was definitely talking about taking an intact system, just redesigning some of the parts, doing artificial evolution to try to push them towards something sort of functional, um, and then tweaking that. Uh, but as as he probably as he indicated, like eleven different genes mutated kind of on their own. There are so many moving parts in that that it's it's very hard to do a design the way an engineer would want it, which is every part is fully um, defined and its interactions with everything else are fully defined. And that's where living systems completely screw us up because I don't know of a single systems biology that top down approach experiment that has ever been very good at predicting the outcomes. Um, it's really interesting what happens, but it's almost never what you thought was going to happen because of how many interacting parts there are that we still can't really describe. So uh, my own interest has been very much in this bottom up approach where you redesign the components, let them work together in some sort of protocell environment, figure out, okay, they don't really work the way I wanted to, but it's a much simpler system to refine. And the thing that I just thought is so cool 
is this, um, we now have, well, I think it was an alien genome potential. So it's still in the world of carbon because we live on a world that has carbon and water. Um, I, I, I made a note of a novel. I think it was Alan Dean Jones or something like that. Al, no, Alan Dean Foster wrote of a silicon-based world in some novel called Sentenced to Prism. So he was into bad jokes as well, um, where he had a silicon-based world, but it was coexisting with a carbon-based world. And the thermodynamicists all tore their hair out and basically said, Silicon-based world is actually feasible and has good flexibility and good chemistry, but the problem is that it also has to be exist at a much lower temperature. So you sort of have these stratifications of what's liquid and what chemistry and, and polymers will work well in that chemistry. And there's a series that the thermodynamicists have kind of defined, but silicon and carbon together without one of them being in a like enviro suit would not actually work, so um, too bad. So the next best thing for alien DNA is actually to invent completely like just new codons that no living system on earth um, would, would recognize or know what to do with. And so this is called Hachimoji DNA. Steve Benner um, has been working on it as well as, I'm trying to remember the other guy's name, Floyd Romsberg. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. He's at the Scripps Institute. So he developed a six-base version, but then he sort of wrote this fabulous editorial about the wonderful eight-base version, so I figured I'd go with that. So in, in, in addition to the CG and the TA, which we all memorized a gazillion years ago, there's also PZ and BS. And I find the mnemonic of BS is pretty easy to remember. And then there's also a um, blogger who writes a blog called Feringula, um, whose name is PZ Myers. So that's my mnemonic for the PZ base pairs. Um, but at any rate, they're, they have hydrogen bonds, they fill the same space, and so they leave the same aperiodic crystal form of the DNA, and they don't disrupt it in ways that would make you very mutation prone. They've been able to make messenger RNA from this using the cognates of the PZ and SB. Um, and then, so instead of having to go in and replace nonsense codons or one of the redundant codons like Anna was talking about, see, I can connect this to one of the other panelists, um, you can actually simply develop your whole new um, codon set with new amino acids. But of course, that means you have to develop, let's see if I've got the picture. Yes, you will have to develop new tRNAs and new tRNA transferases in order to produce these hybrid proteins. Um, or pure proteins in the alternate um, alien DNA version. So some of the advantages of this is that you can actually maybe make therapeutics that would never undergo horizontal gene transfer that's productive, right? Because the, the new cells that this passes around to don't have a clue what to do with PZ and um, BS or, and, and don't have the tRNAs or the tRNA you know, transfer transfer amino acyl transferases that they would need. So in addition to my science fiction love of making like completely different organisms with a completely different like biology that coexist in our world, there's also lots of very practical biotech stuff that you could do with this. And I just think it's very cool that they use both a combination of structure filling models, like it has to meet this aperiodic crystal requirement, but also in information theory about what kinds of um, building blocks you have to use in order to convey the same kind of information kind of at the same thermodynamics so it doesn't take over. So anyway, that's my my very geeky down in the weeds interest. In so we've been talking about viruses. I presume our current viruses couldn't infect a, an organism like this. Exactly. Well, I mean, they, could, they might be able to recognize an ACE2 receptor, which I, I understand is one of the, I, so endocytosis might still happen, but once it got into the cell, it's, it, it, couldn't, it couldn't, it has to replicate. Really. Yeah, it can't replicate, it has no idea what all this BS and PZ stuff is, and what are these tRNAs, and what is the stop code in, in this particular set, so yeah, it wouldn't work at all, so none of those, um, 
So it really would be a parallel biology. I don't know what would happen with a hybrid biology. Nobody knows what would happen with a hybrid biology. In the science fiction mode, you could imagine making a, a group of clones that are hybrid DNA, and because they're not perfectly our kind of DNA, they become slaves or secondary citizens, or, or, or of course, outlive us all because they're not, they're not actually susceptible to the same viruses and bacteria. So there's lots of options for writing novels, which I don't do, so somebody else will have to do that. <laughs> Um, but at any yeah. rate, so I, I'm out of time for the panelists, and so ideally there will be some Q&A questions, or we can keep talking until people get bored and leave. Um, but I didn't want to take up too much time. Yeah, I think we'll have a two-minute warning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we're up on our, our time on it. Yeah, right. Okay. All right, well, um, I, so I was also told to let the uh, participants know that we will we will fade to, now I can't remember the name of it. It's not. Discord. 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 Yeah. I haven't done Discord, so I'm informed that I will have to register first, which mm -hmm. I, and Anna said the same thing. So we, yeah. will, we will do that, but we'll be late joining you if you decide you have some later questions. And I think most of us are perfectly fine if you want to email at us. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, our emails are all on our slides are on the slide and if you just want to independently ask one of us about one thing we talked about that other people didn't, I'm perfectly happy to do that as well. 